not that they're insignificant, but they're all increasing. And here are some of the symptoms that are associated with Lyme disease. It's caused by a particular kind of bacteria known as a spirochete. Its name is Borrelia burgdorferi, and it will produce a rash that is unique among all the rashes caused by ticks and uh, insect bites and so on. And then it has a broad outer ring and a, a large um, coloration in the center. We call this a bullseye rash. And among the negative adverse symptoms are the most important being arthritis, sometimes very severe in the knees, the fingers, and anywhere in the body, or Bell's palsy, where there is damage to the nerves associated with various parts of the face. Uh, most of these symptoms are not life threatening, but they're life limiting, causing morbidity that could be lifelong and very tragic. A few biological features are as well known greatly, but the heart ticks have only one nymphal stage, and the females see only one and lay enormous amounts of eggs. You can see a huge amount of eggs from this one female tick. But she has grown almost a hundred times her original body weight and translated most of that, 60 to 70 percent, into eggs. Um, and they do this while feeding the salivary gland. The most important element in this is the salivary gland and also secretes all the excess water back into the host in those same foods. And this happens only once. The soft ticks, on the other hand, have several nymphal stages. They feed very rapidly within minutes. They can live for very long periods of time. And each time they feed again, they lay a few out of food, hundreds, not tens of thousands. The life cycle is very long. In the case of the Lyme disease tick, it will take about two years. And as well as all the different phases, but it starts usually in the spring or summer with the larva, ends up with the nymph, and the five and fall. And that's the very dangerous stage which transmits uh, the spirochete. And finally, the adults appear in the fall and feed on deer. And this gives you a little insight into the different pathogens and how they're distributed. Um, for example, the Lyme disease agent, Borrelia, binds to particular receptors on the digestive tract of the tick, the region known as the mid gut. And when it does so, it proliferates when the nymphal tick begins to feed. It acquires them as larvae, but when it molts and then molts into a nymph, the nymph feeds, and then the um, tick, <coughs> excuse me, the um, Borrelia and Spirochetes break loose and they escape into the hemolymph, the, the circulating fluid, um, and you pick up transmitogen in, in the course of doing so. And they also operate and regulate a different protein called outer surface protein C. There's an enzyme like protein in the sal salivary glands that captures that, binds to it, that also recognizes transmitogen, and that enables the um, these uh, bacteria to be transmitted in such a way that they're not recognized by the host. In other words, this provides a protection for the migrating bacteria. This takes about two days. Other pathogens, such as the uh, agents that like uh, plasma or the, uh, even the viruses, they, they transmit a very deadly virus, can be transmitted within minutes to hours. So the timing is very important to understand what pathogen you're looking at and which ones you're trying to control in terms of how fast they can escape from the feeding tick into the new host. So now we're getting to the real subject of uh, this afternoon's talk, namely the, how the tick secretes the agents that counteract the host immune system and the whole system, we call this a anti-hemostatic mechanism. So the host, when, when your body is wounded, you have agents that play an important role in shutting off the blood supply, causing the blood to coagulate around the wound site, and then to protect the 
to the body from excessive blood loss. The, jo- the, rob- me, the job of the text is to counteract that. And so one of the first things it does is inserts its mouth part here into the, the skin and then secretes the milk. This is the only pathogen, the only uh, vector among all the ultrasound vectors that does something like this. None of them makes the milk. It glues itself with one of the most potent cements in the animal kingdom. And it glues itself into position. It takes about a day for it to harden up. And if you try to remove the thing that has fully cemented itself in place, you're undoubtedly going to rip and tear the skin, the little the wound, or the bleed. That's how thoroughly embedded it is. And then, when that is established, it begins to secrete all these different agents. Far too many for you to understand when you're looking at one quick overview. But there are agents that block macrophages. There are agents that block the dendritic cells, the cells that normally live in the skin. There are others that block neutrophils, and still others that uh, interfere with complements. Uh, the anti complements are very important because they can have an immune function, and the antibodies are not work unless they coordinate with complements. The agent that does that is known as ISAC. The sodium saccharide is anti complement of our stem cells. And then many cytokines are secreted from these cells, and the tick has agents in its saliva. Different molecules will block those cytokines, so it is effectively disrupting the T cell and it is calling in other agents. And the whole result is, and the person who has never experienced a tick bite, or the dog, or the other pet animals or members of your own various livestock, there is no immune activation to call these sick, naive individuals. And the sick is able to feed for days without any interruption by the health. This is the, the, what we call the early inflammatory response, so there is very little inflammation in the sick, naive individuals. Here is a somewhat simplified version of the same story, where we see the uh, structure of the skin, the epidermis, the epidermis, and the fatty layer. The tick secreting saliva, and these wiggly lines represent the healing state and the cytokine that is transmitted. And all these different agents that I've labeled here are salivary proteins among the 500 different salivary proteins that the tick has, believe it or not, that many, hundreds of them are uh, secreted. They don't they have you know, a secretion signal that enables them to come out and then the mature peptides get into the skin. And they circulate in there to create a privileged environment that disrupts the uh, normal hemostatic mechanism, blocks all these different cell types from interfering with tick feeding. Among the most important is what we call the lipid chamber. This is a serum produce inhibitor or serpent, after the serpent stands for, that blocks histamine. Well, if you haven't gotten sick with an ordinary cold, uh, it may be something more severe where your nose is dripping and your sinuses are all swollen and you're very uncomfortable and you don't seek help, the doctor will probably prescribe an antihistamine. To come up with you know, various trade names, but the main ingredient will be an antihistamine, which helps to dry that up and, and uh, restore the normal uh, healthy functions. So the tip is engineered a protein to block that so that that prevents the itching and pain that you would normally associate with an insect bite. Except these ticks are not insects, they're in the in spider type group. And the end result is that people, or animals, frequently don't even know they have a tick. Can you imagine that the, the thing is feeding on your skin for hours and days, and you're totally unaware of it? For the first few minutes, yes, you would feel it. But once it gets fully established and secreting this entire armamentarium of the genetic of different agents, you then lose all, all awareness and Without the itching and pain sensation, there's nothing to, to call your attention to it to scratch it off and remove it. And that is the amazing mechanism that no other 
that the boy occupied that with some confidence. The end result could look something like this. And this is from a rabbit that was fed upon multiple times by a chip. Now this is where the normal hemostatic mechanism comes into play and because this animal has been sensitized to pick by multiple feeding, this is probably the third time it was used to pick the year, the skin is now beginning to respond vigorously to block the tip, and the end result is a tremendous breakdown of the brain, leaving a large lesion which we initially thought was just a blood flow, but actually on fresh, careful examination, we find it mostly filled with loop. And you can see where the tip is attaching the cement, you notice this area here looks like a, a reverse image of the tip's mouth parts, where all the pieces and segments of the hypostone are inserted into the skin. And here is the tip itself falling apart. The internal organs are getting disrupted, they're undergoing disintegration. Because instead of feeding on hemoglobin, it's feeding on lymph, which is not a nutrient material, and they begin to break down and die. Now, I want to run through a more recent study that we've done at the NIH, where we've been looking at the histopathology of the tick bite region in guinea pigs and what happens in unsensitized, the tick naive guinea pigs, and then what happens when it's desensitized. And you can see the tick, you can see where it was attached in this histopathological uh, image. There is the epidermis undergoing expansion, hyper-involvement uh, here, and um, what we call hyperplasia, and keratosis is taking place. But overall, there's not much of an inflammatory response. Here is an enlargement. And one curious thing, which does happen in guinea pigs, but doesn't happen in natural hosts, such as mice in the natural environment, in the natural small rodents, uh, is the beginning to break down of uh, the vernal architecture. Uh, collagenases are going full blast to break down the collagen, and, and a small tributary lesion is beginning to take place. These large structures here, by the way, are from uh, the base of the head, so don't confuse that. The moral of the story here is that there is very little rejection of the tick in this animal who has never seen the tick before. He's been eating three days of continuous feeding. And then the other thing we were able to do is to immunohistochemistry, where we look at um, the uh, molecules that it resides on the surface of different kinds of uh, white blood cells. So here is a normal HME, that is a human-toxic leucine image. And these other images are the ones that show the presence of the uh, external molecules that characterize those particular cell types. This, for example, what we call the CD3, tells that these are two lymphocytes that are migrating rapidly and early into the wound site and then surrounding the, the area of the lesion. The lesion is growing in this whole region here. But also, very few eosinophils. It's very common with infection to have eosinophilia, especially in the lungs and other internal organs, but much less so in the skin. So, although we're not ruling that out, we have some other evidence that they really do enter into the tick bite. But mostly what we see in enormous numbers of macrophages and quite a few uh, neutrophils, which in the case of guinea pigs are known um, as heterophils. Don't confuse them when you read your textbooks, so in your textbooks call them heterophils. In North America, we call them neutrophils. So the, the main message here is the immunohistochemistry tells us which are the prominent antibiotics microbial actors that are playing a major role in the, the entry of macrophages. <clears throat> now here we get to a sensitized animal. This guinea pig has been fed upon multiple times. And the main takeaway here is the growth of the, uh, the tick bite region. The whole area of the venomous is undergoing tremendous disruption, forming a huge cavitary lesion, as we will learn today. 
and it's a tremendous amount of show places of the skin. So the end result is the, the, uh, we lost the tick by position here to have the same damage or illusion. The tick is no longer firmly anchored into the skin. Even though there's been secreted cement, the, the whole area of the dermis where it is um, attached is the undergoing disintegration. And so the tick is now released, and the bird can easily scratch it off, which is usually what they do. And then we can make sure they show evidence of the tick. And here we see, again, the image of chemistry of the same story. You see the two small lymphocytes, tremendous amounts of macrophages, and you see that just for the head of the lymphocytes, and they're all just playing an important role. So the moral of the story is we know what cytokines are also involved because we know which ways that they make, and we're now also looking at the ways in which six salivary proteins that are entering the skin may be interfering with cytokine production. So the, the ontogeny of the tick bite is characterized here in this story. <coughs> On the left hand side, Far to the left, you see the different stages of the tick bite. And I've categorized this in a table form to show you how the progression from attachment to completion of feeding takes place. And what happens during that process is the regard to pathogen transmission, focusing uh, mostly on Borrelia, but only uh, also in general. So at first, the tick inserts its small parts, the hypostone in particular. It seeks to create this cement, and then, then it secretes anti-hemostatic compounds, which silence the host pain and its responses. One of the big actors that plays a role in that process is known as bradykinin. It's a natural um, enzyme in our in our blood, which uh, signals pain and its uh, triggers pain and its responses. And then they, they secrete uh, molecules that silence really coming in among them. There is very little transmission of Borrelia at this stage. In fact, there's none. In this first couple of days. Others, though, are transmitted, such as the plasma, which can activate early or the virus. And then we look over here to an animal that has been sensitized or a human being that has had repeated episodes of tick bite. It could be a uh, field worker, somebody out in the uh, camping or hiking, or it could be a uh, guide who's leading students on field trips and frequently exposed to ticks and then just uh, has no way of completely blocking it. So they are now going to react somewhat differently. The salivary anti-hemostatic compounds that enter the host are unable to now overwhelm the enormous overwhelming response to the host, so they don't completely silence the itch and pain response. Still no Borrelia is crafted during this early stage, but if, a, if the animal or the human being now becomes aware of the tick, it can remove it before Borrelia can be transmitted. That won't stop anaplasma or the viruses, but it will certainly prevent Lyme disease. Now we get to the second stage where the tick saliva creates the skin lesion. This is called the feeding pool or the feeding lesion where the tick drinks blood which contains all the different you know, blood elements and it's mainly the erythrocytes that the tick wants which it lyses, liberating hemoglobin and the tick is able to feed successfully. There is now the chance for Borrelia transmission and now in second and third days, and since there's no blocking, so it really are able to be transmitted. But in the case of the sensitized host or animal, the tick saliva induces such massive inflammation that there's massive influx of the immune cells, the lesion fills with white blood cells, and <clears throat> very little in the way of the hemoglobin is liberated for the tick to feed on. And so effectively, there is strong tick rejection. There is blockage of transmission of the area. Uh, and then, very successfully, usually the host by this time has 
the different channels that they secrete. Suppress histamine so you don't feel anything. It also blocks the basal cells and mast cells, which are the source of histamine. And blocking histamine also enhances the dilation of the blood vessels, increasing blood flow. And it also produces an antioxidant pressure. And it also produces this compound, the angiotensin converting enzyme, and we call it ACE, which you may have begun to hear about a great deal more now that we have COVID 19 everywhere. And we look into the biology of that interaction, as you can see that through this molecule. And these and the other, like the metallic proteases, block great brain economy. And the third thing is to stop platelets. So that also blocks the coagulation mechanism. And um, complement is blocked by these other enzymes. What is that? Salt 15, salt 20. The term salt refers to salivary salivary lipoprotein. So there are a lot of different salivary proteins, and people are given them names to, for convenience. You can look them up and see brass filters and find them for frequency. So that's not even the whole story. There are still others. Self 15 is another histamine binding protein, and salivary lectin tensor inhibitors. And it's just amazing how many different ways in which the tissue has figured out how to. Disrupt the natural desire of the host, the natural ability of the host to carry out its control of blood flow and protect itself, and it's just able to minimize that, at least in that small area around the tip of the body, not destroying the entire body, but it was certainly effective in the zone of the tip region. Subsequently, the brain cytokines are able to disperse. The reason I bring this up in so much detail. Is that is enabling, enabling the tick, excuse me, enabling the disease agent now to stay and survive long enough in the zone of the tick bite to now begin to spread into the surrounding tissue. This causes localized inflammation and spreads through the skin into the nerves and causes neuritis and all kinds of nerve associated injuries. And also finds its way into uh, protected areas like the synovial membrane and the synovium of the joints. So that would play in the arthritis in the joints, especially the large joints. So the moral of the story is this is not a blood borne type of pathogen, it's a tissue bound pathogen. And the ability to take to protect the spirochetes in the feeding region long enough, the day or two, before the host can overreact, overreact to this, is what contributes to the success of the Lyme disease spreading and dispersing throughout the body. Within hours to days, most viruses begin to disperse elsewhere into the skin, and that leads to the familiar bullseye rash. That's why you don't often don't see the bullseye rash right in the open, exactly in the place where the tick bite took place, the caterpillar rash. But it can then spread and occur almost anywhere in the body. Others disperse and may be focused on the nerve, joints, and still other organs, or even cases of arthritis um, and um, damage to nerve um, and vessels and so on. The result is Lyme disease becomes a multi system disorder, as that's so true. And the effect is the major contributor to this uh, whole process. Although we consider, consider the bacterium Lyme disease, bacterium is the main criminal. The tick is like the uh, one that's <coughs> driving the getaway car and um, is brought to get the criminal to the, the bank robber site and then they can drive it away. It's, it's the one that's protecting the tick. Ticks are unique among all blood feeding ossifiers by attaching to the host skin for long periods so that they can drink enormous volumes of blood. In nature, we will find millions and millions of ticks dispersed throughout the environment. Only a small percentage, about one or two percent, succeed in attaching to a host, and only a small percentage of those finally complete their meal. But those are two, 
to compensate for all these other losses by writing a message between 5 and 10,000 eggs in a single city. So when they attempt to see the fish had to cement themselves in place and then counter the host to the center of the country. So we say that fish are masterful biological engineers, showing the ability to silence the pain and its responses, block blood coagulation, disrupt wound repair, block complements, minimally important, um, because you can't have antibody function without it, and overall just minimizes the immune challenge. The fixed feeding mechanism enhances the transmission and survival of the Lyme disease bacteria to the other bacteria. And we call this process saliva assisted transmission. I keep on telling you that idea that without the ability of the fish to detect and create a sequestered and, and a secure environment based on host interaction. There would be a little spread of the agent that that bacteria would be quickly destroyed. So, saliva assisted transmission enables dispersal of the agent and essentially the onset of the disease itself. The fixed feeding region provides privileged microenvironments in the host field where the spider can proliferate and base the run and quickly and proliferate throughout the body. And this, to a degree, happens with other tick borne diseases as well. But nothing quite as, as amazing as what it does for these uh, delivery spiders. With that, I want to thank my uh, colleagues at Oregon University and uh, at the NIH. Uh, <coughs> special thanks to Dr. Hazen for his work. Jose Rivero, a man that uh, goes on to study tick borne diseases, is not an extremely familiar with research going back. 40 years or so. Um, he was originally from Brazil, Dr. Bill as well, and worked with him in Mexico. Members of our um, unit at the LMDR, the laboratory for malaria and vector research, are uh, from Latin America, especially from Brazil. And we um, also thank Dr. Ian Miller from the uh, Comparative Medicine Board. And with that, time to go get some lunch, get some pizza. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Danielle. Um, it's really, really on time. <laughs> That's wonderful. We have uh, 10 minutes for questions. I will start uh, with actually a question, but uh, congratulations. Dr. Fabio Scott uh, is the uh, coordinator of the Program said thank you, Dr. Sun and Sunlight, for your talk. And he said it's an honor to have you here. It really is. And he asks, um, he, he said, the work has uh, inspired, well, the study has inspired many students of our um, program, the work with kids. So, what are the opportunities for tick research in the future? I'm glad you asked that question because it may seem that I've covered everything that one needs to know and there's nothing more to learn. That would be an absolute mistake. There is so much that we don't know. For example, I mentioned the cytokines and chemokines. So, yes, you can recognize many of the molecules, excuse me, many of the cells, but what are they producing and how does the tick handle action? Because most of the success stories act at the molecular level. Molecules are called in uh, signaling molecules to bring in agents that will then secrete uh, antibiotics or anti-mycosis agents that are lytic to so bind to and connections uh, that will characterize and oxidize the, uh, the, the pathogen the destruction. And the thing is blocking it. How does it do that? What are the different molecules? I've mentioned over 500 different cellular gland molecules, and many of them have been characterized, but nowhere near the entire group. What are the other groups? And perhaps they're playing important roles in that aspect of it. There is a great deal more to be learned about the biology of the vegetable cell, including reproduction. So, um, 
I'm calling your attention to a new library, the most recent edition of my two volume book. This is a co edited work. Biology Tips in two volumes, 34 different chapters. And many of the things I've talked about will find there. Of course, they're already out of date. Every time you never you publish anything, they decide to get that in the print, it's already out of date. But it will give you a sort of a foundation or a grounding to look for it. We have three other questions, uh, and we still have time to do them. Um, Professor Douglas Martin Thompson has said a number. He said a number of studies have examined the comparative microbiome of tick saliva from three different species. In almost all cases, the saliva microbiome is more diverse than the media microbiome. Uh, how about dominated by few bacteria species? We form a stable core microbiome. Many of those bacteria produce weak cell proteins, which can impact upon the host innate and adaptive immune systems. In this way, these bacterial proteins become a component of the salivary proteome. Could the constant presence of those bacteria and their weak cell proteins contribute to the severity of tick bites in previously sensitized humans or and or play a role in pathogen transmission? The short answer to that question is almost it's yes to the question. In other words, probably yes, but we need to prove it. And I say yes because this is part of the saliva activated transmission. It's more than just the tick saliva, the tick well, the tick may not be intentionally doing this, but these bacteria that found a home in the tick salivary gland are making the central molecules that you mentioned the heat shock protein yes. that play, that likely play an important role in the survival of the pathogen once they leave the uh, sequestered environment of the salivary gland cell. The most important ones are intracellular bacteria which are passed from generation to generation. You mentioned the diversity in the mid gut. That's complicated by a lot of environmentally acquired bacteria that are not really integral in the mind. And also due to the host, right? Also that. They were getting it from the skin of the host, which is way too good. So these, these are bacteria that are going to be eliminated in the next program. So they may survive to the tip of a very dirty environment for most of its life, but fighting on the ground. And they release litter in the vegetation. The board requires so many different microbes. Many of them have to live in there, but as soon as the tick feeds, blood changes everything, and a lot of the um, waste is then eliminated from the tick's mid gut, and the mid gut cells are filled with masses and masses of hematin like uh, black material, as well as undigested or uh, partially digested hemoglobin. And all that is passed out as material species as the tick feeds. And that's good for one of these uh, bacteria as well. And blood meal feeding also changes the pH, which is uh, critically important for the survival of bacteria, which species in its own preferred pH range. So the end result is that the, the microbiome of the feeding tick, the fed female, they look rather different than the microbiome of the insect. Not so in the case of such saliva. We have two other questions from Dr. Guillermo's class, which is so who's also one of our speakers today. Dr. Guillermo is that in Brazil, we have some uh, majorly new cases of Lyme disease, of Lyme like disease. What is more likely to occur? A lower pathogenicity in the local bacteria or a less protective environment promoted by exogenous saliva? Well, we learned from some of these same problems in the United States. Mm-hmm. Well, he said that exogenous saliva factors in saliva. That's an interesting question, Ron. In a humble way, I would answer that I don't know the answer. And 
I've learned, I've learned humility in the course of many, many years, over 50 years in this field. Likely, the survival of the cell life similarity to other Australian species in the same group that we saw the Australian Mystinous group, the Mystinous and Scapulatic group, which is dispersed mostly throughout the northern hemisphere. So we have the very Pacific group in the west coast of the United States, the Scapulatic in the middle of the group, and then we have Mystinous and um, one or two other species, the coastal tendons of Asia. And if you draw a circle around the northern hemisphere, you find all these species of the rest of the group. Where does lower tendons fall? I haven't had a chance to look into that. But if it's a member of this closely related rest of the group, there's a good chance that the cell of the proteins, the array of different proteins, they look similar. Other facilities have very different life cycles. And although the genus is enormous, only 200 different species, and we know little about the similarity and complexity of their celebrated protein profiles across the board. That's a wonderful study for the groups to continue with. Indeed, indeed. Also asking, do you see a pathway for disruption of transmission of uh, bacteria by blocking or disrupting these saliva components by using vaccines based on these antigens? Absolutely. We, uh, we only see it, we're working on it. It's a target of the current research. So, uh, blocking the ability of these um, six proteins to uh, interfere with with uh, normal hemostasis, the anti-hemostatic protein. And it's more complicated by the fact that out of the six genes, it changes the six uh, salivary protein profile. The saliva of day one is very different than the saliva of day four and day five, if it seems that long. Um, many of the proteins that are upregulated on, on, on many of the genes that are upregulated on day one and produce a coding for proteins that are very important in the cemented and the earlier uh, disruption of the growth in the, in the hemolysis are um, down-regulated and others take place, others are up-regulated that are more important in the uh, hemodynamic hum- sequestration of capsid and the class encoded six in the environment of the midget and also internalization. The um, feeding takes place internally inside the cell not in the room. And so there's a whole different array of um, very different protein profiles, and they keep switching. So what you learn from day one may not apply to day two, or day three, or what's the job you do. You always have to get into single cell and exome sequences to really understand what what's going on. Yeah. And that would be a fun thing. That would be a great job to do. And well, this wonderful talk. Thank you.